Welcome to Mindful on Wall Street's Fireside Chat with Matt Harris. A little bit of context for those of you who are new to Mindful on Wall Street. So who are we? We were born during this pandemic, believe it or not. Um, we are a grassroots collaboration of mindfulness champions across the financial services industry. We seek to amplify the reach of mindfulness within our respective and peer institu institutions. And what we also like to do is, is shine the spotlight on mindful leaders like Matt Harris, who have really achieved a degree of outer success, which we applaud and, and are very excited about, but more importantly, done so with a backbone and a foundation in mindfulness and compassion, which we truly celebrate. So we love to celebrate both the outer and inner journey of these leaders. So just before we get started, um, just wanted to invite you to really use this time as an opportunity to practice mindful listening. So I know many of you are practitioners of mindfulness. You know that our minds wander 49% of the time. It's what we do. So while we're here at this fireside chat, your mind is going to wander. But can you notice that? And maybe just not judge it maybe just note where it wandered and then just gently guide it back to this conversation we're having. And you'll be practicing mindfulness right here, right now. So it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Matt Harris. You've all seen his impressive bio, but I will just call out a few highlights. Matt is the founding partner of Global Infrastructure Partners, a leading infrastructure investment firm managing over 72 billion in assets. Prior to the formation of GIP in 2006, Matt held a variety of leadership roles at Credit Suisse, including as co-head of the Global Energy Group, head of the Europe, Middle East and Africa Emerging Markets Group, and co-head of the Americas Mergers and Acquisitions Group. Matt is also the founder of Bidari, an impact company focused on health and wellness, energy transition, and environmental conservation. Bidari recently collaborated with UCLA, Matt's alma mater, and established a 20 million endowment to create the UCLA Bidari Kindness Institute. Matt serves on a number of boards, including Columbia University Center for Global Energy Policy, UCLA College of Social Sciences Dean's Advisory Board, the Whole Health Institute, and the World Wildlife Fund. So Matt, we're so delighted to have you here with us today. Uh, we know how busy you are and really appreciate you carving out the space here to share with us your journey in mindfulness. Well, Lita, thank you very much. My pleasure. It's great to be here. So Matt, why don't you start by telling us how you define mindfulness? Well, to me, it's, it's, the, it's the practice, and it is a practice of being able to be fully open and fully present for whatever you are experiencing at any given moment. You know, we, we grow up particularly in Western culture where, and, and you had the statistic of 49% of the time, your mind is wandering. I, 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 I wish for me it was only 49% of the time. But we, we grow up, particularly in Western culture, you know, thinking about, you know, the future, thinking about the past, and that often distracts from what's actually happening in our lives. And I, I, my, my personal experience over many years is that your life is really a collection of these small precious moments, these threads that get knitted together over your lifetime. And mindfulness is really, for me, it's been the key to being able to experience those moments. And you know that, that includes not only joyful and hopeful loving moments, but also very difficult moments in our lives where um, things happen that we may, you know, we may wish didn't, whether it's the loss of a loved one or the loss of a job, anything difficult. But it, it really is, it's being fully open and able to experience what is going on in your life in this moment. So can you think back to what was the catalyst? What brought you to mindfulness? Tell us about how it all started with you. Well, for me, it was, a, it, it was not, and life never is. It was definitely not a straight line. Uh, um, you know, I grew up 
in a um, in a home that on the surface looked you know very normal to 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 siblings you know we did not come from wealth we came from a solid middle class family um and from the outside looking in it looked like what you would typically see in the 60s and 70s when i was growing up but th there were a number of things going on in our family system and I, and i use the word covert as opposed to overt um that really shaped and influenced um you know how I grew up and ultimately, you know, the path I chose when I, uh, when I came to New York in my early 20s after graduating from university. I mean, there were two things that were really sort of critical pieces to that. One was, I, I didn't learn in my family system that my worth and my esteem um, was generated from the inside out. I learned that it was generated from the outside in. And when that was set, this idea that your worth is predicated on something outside of you, it has a dramatic impact on how you lead your life. The other thing I didn't learn how to do is develop emotional competence to know what I was feeling, you know, fear, pain, love, joy, anger, guilt, you know, I didn't have uh, the lexicon of one of the basic elements of life. Dan Goldman has a great book called Emotional Intelligence. And he actually believes and has a, a, quite a bit of data to support this, that successful people actually have more EQ than IQ. Um, but this was all foreign to me. And so when I, um, you know, was growing up and when I got to university and when I got to New York, you know, I had this belief system that told me that I had to do certain things from the outside in, in order to be, in order to have worth and value. And I didn't know how to really experience what was going on in my life emotionally. And the net effect of that is I looked for ways to adapt. I looked for ways to um, deal with uh, the very strong feelings that were going on inside of me. And this this idea that my worth and value could be questioned, it could be bartered, it could be traded, it was conditional on something outside of me. And that took me through, you know, lots of different things, but it ultimately culminated in needing to make some very dramatic changes in my life, um, get sober, let go of alcohol, let go of poor relationships, and let go of too much work, frankly. Uh, work can be a way to address um, uh, a lot of the things that I was dealing with. So I had to get sober and I had to really make a meaningful number of changes in my life about a decade ago. And, and you know, if, if I would have known then that that was sort of, of kindergarten or nursery school for me in terms of my own journey, um, it probably would have, it certainly would have surprised me. But what I discovered over time is that for me, sobriety was really just the beginning. And um, this idea, it, it was addressing the, the symptoms rather than the cause. And what I really needed to do was start on this journey to um, changing my belief system. Um, and mindfulness and meditation have been a huge part of that. Um, there's nothing in my life that is more important to me than my meditation practice. And I say it that way because meditation to me is the practice. It's the daily thing that I do that allows me to be more mindful as I go through my day. And none of us are perfect. It's, you know, the, this idea of the authentic self and that, you know, whatever you want to call it, the soul, your inner self, your ability to express yourself mindfully and authentically you know, our ego and our histories get in the way of being able to do that uh, perfectly. And that's okay. We're, somebody said to me once, we're all perfectly imperfect. But mindfulness is kind of the way I try to live my life. And my meditation practice is really what, you know, it's the way I practice mindfulness and, and um, the way I try to show up as best I can in my life. Uh, difficult situations or ones that I really look forward to. Thank you for sharing that. It's no wonder that if you think about your worth, 
your change of belief system and how you've gone on this journey from outside in to inside out. And it's no small feat to recognize that's where you were and to even have a sense of discomfort with being there and then the courage to say, there's more here, there's more potential in me. So I think this idea of mindfulness um, being a part of your life and one of the most important things for you and being a practice for the audience. Can you just shed a little more light on what you mean by it being a practice and, and how did it become a practice for you? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a process and it's something that um, what I usually tell people if, if they ask me is, um, it's more important to have frequency and repetition than it is how long you practice for. And I, I, I think you said it, it took me, it took me a while to understand that there is, um, there are many planes of our, you know, the way that we exist in life. There's a physical plane, obviously, there's a mental plane, a thought-based plane, there's an emotional plane, uh, and there's a spiritual plane. And I really lived through much of my life consumed by my thoughts, believing that what my thoughts told me were ac was accurate. And I like to tell people sometimes the average human being has somewhere between 80 and 100,000 thoughts each day. And a very large percentage of those actually either don't make any sense or not, are, are not accurate, are based on the belief system or the family system or the conditioning that we grew up with. And they become you know, part of our patterning, part of, part, part of our ego pattern. Um, and so the, the practice of meditation and mindfulness is being able over time to become an observer of those thoughts, an observer of your life. It's almost like there's the projector and the movie screen. And the, the, you, know, you, you are in effect the observer, you're the projector, however you wanna think about it. And there's this movie that's playing and it's your, it's your life, it's your story. Um, it's very hard to be an observer if you're in your thoughts all the time. And we've all seen people, I know I was one of them, who are, who are just ruminating and constantly in, I was constantly in my head about uh, what was going on. It was very unconscious. So as I started a med meditation practice about a decade ago, and frankly, I started one because people told me, you want to get sober, you got to do this. Um, and it started out very modestly. Um, it started out for two or three minutes uh, a day. And um, what I found over those early years is sometimes it was really hard to sit even for that period of time with my own thoughts and with, my, with myself. Um, I was so used to acting on these thoughts and having these thoughts dictate the decisions and the behaviors that I made. Gradually over time, I started to get more space. Gradually over time, I could become much more of an observer. Gradually over time, my practice grew. Today, I sit for about 45 minutes every morning when I get up in the morning at, um, at six o'clock. And it's my time where nobody is up in my home and I can just sit and um, people may identify with this, but when we're sleeping, that's a time when our thoughts are really, you know, percolating, they're really moving. So when I get, get up in the morning, I got a lot of thoughts about what am I gonna do during the day? What didn't I do yesterday? For me, it's really important to just center myself and, and enter into my practice. And I don't think I can ever remember a day where I didn't come out of it feeling like I was centered and ready to get into my day. And during the course of the day, you obviously, you know, things happen, you get off balance, but to me, mindfulness meditation is really all about a practice to recenter yourself, to practice to find whatever for you represents your true north or your center line. How you get back to that without um, staying trapped in those patterns for any longer than you need to. So that was probably a long way of answering your question, Lolita, but it, 
it, it, it's definitely a practice. And I, I tell people often, start small, start modestly in terms of the time. It's much more important to try to do it every day so that you build up. And after 30 days, if you do even two or three minutes a day, you'll see big changes. Thank you, Matt. I think when you talk about not being your thoughts, not believing your thoughts, watching your thoughts like a movie, there's freedom right there, freedom to choose. Um, and it's, it's amazing that you started out just consistently with two to three minutes. You built up a practice of 45 minutes a day in the morning. And so when you sit for those 45 minutes, what type of meditation do you do when you just sit? Well, that's, you know, that's evolved over the, over the years as well. And I, and I want to, you know, I just want to be clear about this. There, there, there really is no correlation between the amount of time you meditate necessarily and, and, and what, you know, is right or wrong or works. It, it, it's a very personal thing. And I know some people who meditate for five minutes a day or less and, you know, they're some of the most centered people I know. So I don't, I don't want to give anybody the impression that, well, I got to sit, you know, in silence for 45 minutes every morning. That's absolutely not the case. You can, you can walk, you know, it could be music. It could be, it could, it could be anything. Um, I think the key to it is repetition and being able to get some space and slowly learn how to become an observer of your life. Um, become an observer of your thoughts, become an observer of your story. Um, to me, that's the, that's the key. Maybe, maybe it's easier to do by demonstrating that. Maybe you'd like to lead a practice for us. Sure, I'd be, I'd be more than happy to do that. I, I use, I think you'd ask me what my practice, you, to, today I use uh, sort of a mantra base called primordial sound meditation, but a, a practice I really like is a, a loving kindness uh, meditation. If you have somebody, and it could be yourself, could be somebody who you just, you know, have a lot of space in your heart for, it could be, um, it could be a child, it could be a loved one, could be somebody who's having a difficult time during COVID. It could see somebody in your life that's difficult. Um, if you kind of, when we start, you just, just find your breath and, and then just use the following or something like this. Um, I'll do it with um, with my daughter, whose name is Dakota. You know, may, may Dakota be filled with loving kindness today. And just repeat that at your own pace over the three minutes, whoever you would like to insert there. If that doesn't re resonate with you, you can just uh, you can just follow your breath along and try to as best you can observe your thoughts. But my experience has been if I do a loving kindness meditation like that, even for two or three days, my relationship with whoever I'm directing at, including myself, will change. Uh, I'll see change. So maybe um, maybe we'll just go ahead and do that if everybody just kind of gets themselves comfortable. Um, take a deep breath, center yourself. Um, go ahead and find your breath. And we'll, we'll use that mantra however you want to uh, uh, adopt it for three minutes.
Okay, just kind of bring your self back, present yourself back in your body. Deep breath, exhale, and bring yourself back to the present. Thank you. Three minutes makes such a difference. Wow. Yeah, it sure does. We're all in this world where we're on these Zoom calls and you know, it's really, uh, it's really quite, quite restorative to kind of bring yourself back to kind of your body and, uh, and just presence yourself. So thank you for, thank you for allowing us to do that. Wow. Delighted. So delighted to have that three minute pause. Um, I know that work is a big part of all our lives. And a lot of us want to be the same person we are at home as we are at work and have that unification, if you will. So how do we take practices that we build personally and apply them in the workplace? How do you do that? Well, it's hard. It's a hard thing to do. Um, just speaking from my own experience, you know, I, I had a I still do have a role at work that I, you know, identify with that a lot of that is rooted in what I talked about earlier. So I really have to be intentional about, um, about being mindful in my, in my workplace. And that's, for me, it starts with really seeing people and really holding space for people to express who they are. And that doesn't mean that you have to agree with them or have the same viewpoint or, um, or necessarily um, accept um, what somebody is saying or isn't saying, but, but really to find space to honor who they are and where they are coming from. And that's kind of the first piece to it. And that's important for me because if, if I am not mindful, it's easy for me to drift into these patterns of these old patterns, which are very ego based and look like judgment and look like he or she's wrong and I'm right. And I really think that holding space for people to express themselves, it, it, it's this idea of accepting somebody else's reality. It doesn't mean that that has to dictate the decisions that might be made in a, in a workplace or anywhere else, but allowing people to be who they are. Um, it, it really starts there. And when I do that, it's frankly much easier for me to have the clarity uh, around what I think is the right next step in any given situation, whether that you know is is a new investment opportunity, whether it's running a deal, managing an asset. By holding space and allowing people to be who they are, that's allowing me to also do the same. And there's much less confusion from old patterns or old beliefs. I, I can have a lot more clarity, and I also get input. I'm allowed to see all these different perspectives. I really think that leadership is not about telling, you know, we come from a world where whether it's the military or much of corporate America, it's a command and control environment. And um, leadership to me is about inspiring people to be vulnerable. And it doesn't mean that you don't make decisions. It doesn't mean that there isn't somebody who's ultimately responsible for the decision making, but it's creating an environment where people can be vulnerable, where people can be themselves, they can take chances, they can know that they're not going to be judged based on the chances that they take, because that's where you get the most creativity. If you think about, you know, anybody who's been successful, I guarantee you that their success story has not been a straight line. It's been filled with you know, lots of imperfections, lots of um, uh, mistakes. I think I think it, o Oprah has a great line. She said, um, "Mistakes are nothing but the universe telling you to move in a different direction." That, that's all it is. 
Um, and so anybody that has um, achieved anything has done so through this process. And creativity comes when you're willing to engage the process, when you're willing to take chances and, and be bold. Um, one, of the, one of the people that's really influenced my life is Brene Brown. And she wrote a book, you know, a number of years ago now tall, called Daring Greatly. And it's really about, you know, authenticity and, um, and being who you are, finding that path that you are meant to plow in life is, is about vulnerability. And um, I haven't found anybody that's successful that hasn't been vulnerable. And you know, I met a lot of people in my life, including myself, says I don't do vulnerability. Well, anybody that doesn't do vulnerability as you know, is going to have a very hard time in life because we are vulnerable. That's, that's the nature of who we are. So mindfulness kind of helps me tap into that. It helps me see, and, and I can, I've, I've been in a lot of negotiations over the last, you know, decade where my uh, mindfulness has allowed me to see and take a perspective. Wow. That, that fellow, he's really angry or he's feeling a lot of shame or a lot of embarrassment based on what's going on here. And not only is it compassionate, but also helps you find clarity to get to the right answer. Um, so it, it, because it is a process. So I, for me, mindfulness in the workplace is A, incredibly valuable. And it's also a great practice for me because for me, it's where it's the hardest to kind of be consistently mindful because I was set up, as I was saying at the beginning, work was such an important part of my identity. Um, and there's this persona that I, you know, I, ha I had to show up with a certain persona and be a certain way. And this is the role that, you know, is all about that outside in perspective. So mindfulness really helps me to try to let go of that. And it doesn't mean that you don't make decisions. It doesn't mean that you don't set boundaries. It doesn't mean any of that, but it's a, uh, it's a different way of looking at it that for me yields a completely different productivity. Thank you, Matt. I think what I heard from you was just this idea of leadership and, you know, thinking about the kind of leadership we want to foster, being vulnerable, being authentic, being imperfect, willing to take risk, willing to fail, to find that progress and letting go, letting go of ego, letting go of outside metrics to really find that a true progress, which takes courage to, to kind of build that creativity. Um, what I also heard from you is just meeting people where they're at. So holding space and having this non-judgmental beginner's mind and being able to see their point of view and factor that in when you have that conversation. I think that's absolutely right. And, and if someone says, well, how's that going to help? How's that going to help me? How's that going to help my firm? If you think about any firm as really, it, it's the co-creation of many people. It's the, it's the leader. It's, you know, people in all different jobs. I, I think about the world in terms of, of energy. And we're, we're all at, you know, some level energy that's moving around in the world. And if you think about how, um, any firm works, whether it's on Wall Street or any, anywhere else, the more you can get everybody moving in the same direction in terms of their energy and purpose, intention and clarity, the more successful you're going to be. So if you can give people the space to allow them to be who they are, allow their creativity to shine through, I know for sure that your firm's going to be you know, a lot more productive and achieve a lot more. Now, what you'll also discover in that is for some people, it's not the right place for them to be. And that also is incredibly compassionate if, if, if you have those conversations in a transparent way. Um, there's nothing wrong with that, right? It, it, it goes back to what I said earlier, you know, the universe moving you in a different direction. So um, compassion and empathy, um, are no different in the workplace than they should be in our family system or in our friends and relationships. Um, you know, we should be able to hold space for people, allow them to be vulnerable and allow them the opportunity to learn, 
get paid fairly um, and to be heard. There's no, I, I think there's this sort of, actually Brene does a lot of this work with a lot of Fortune uh, 100 companies. She's doing a lot of it with the military now because if you think about this command and control and this idea that you know there's no vulnerability allowed Nowhere is that more present in the military. And you can see when you look at what, what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan and the veterans of those wars, um, you know, they're taught, you know, don't feel this, don't experience this. You know, just, you, you survive and you get through it. Well, they come back from the battlefield and there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of PTSD that has not been processed. And it's a, it's a great example of how, you know, energy needs to, it needs to be allowed to be released. And um, I think if you can accomplish anything close to that in your workplace, and I think there's a lot of examples of companies that are really innovative in doing this now, you're going to get more out of your employee base. So talking about companies that are sort of on this path, Matt, what have you seen in terms of the need to have this sort of training and mindfulness. What are your thoughts on the need to do this? Yeah, I, I think it's it's um, it's a tremendous service to your employees. I know a lot of uh, a lot of corporations now have meditation rooms. They have meditation uh, breaks. They have opportunities. Some some firms will allow you to join Calm or, or an app and some will pay for it. Sometimes health insurance will pay for it. You know, all of these different opportunities, I think, give people an opportunity to develop a practice that works for them. And, you know, anytime you're able to do that, it's a, it's a good thing. And I think it's going to add to, um, add to the quality of the, of the work that's occurring in, um, in the workplace. So I, I think more and more firms are moving towards this, right? I think it's started in Silicon Valley, but you know it's moving in the direction of the military, big corporations, hedge funds. I mean, here we are, mindfulness on Wall Street. Uh, when I first came to Wall Street in the 1980s, I can assure you there was no mindful on Wall Street organization that I was aware of. So you know we're, we, we've achieved a lot, and I think. We're, we're not yet at a point where you can necessarily quantify any of this empirically, um, but we'll get there too, where people will really start to see the changes and you'll probably ultimately have some set of metrics that you'll be able to, to judge this by. But um, I, it, it's only logical, we're talking about changes in our lives that come about because of mindfulness and a meditation practice that bringing that into the workplace will be will be a big benefit to the, the firm and the employees. Yeah, no, definitely. We are mindful on Wall Street. are really gratified to see the interest as we're talking to other companies about it and other champions are spurring up. So there is a movement and we're certainly very hopeful. Um, Matt, could you talk a little bit about the investment process that you do on a day-to-day -day basis? And I know you talked about holding space and it helping you with negotiations. Can you talk more about when you look at that investment process from considering opportunities or even executing on them and managing them and, 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 and that whole cycle, if you will, how, how do you bring mindfulness in there? Well, again, I think it, it starts with, you know, what, how present are you to any of that? Um, you know, that, that might be, you know, a new investment opportunity. And it, uh, when, when I'm mindful about looking at it, I have a lot more clarity. I don't, you know, I'm, I'm able to take lessons learned from past investments, but they, they don't necessarily dictate the decision I make about the present investment. Uh, they inform me, but they don't, uh, they don't put me in a box with respect to my thinking. Um, I, I try a lot to be mindful with the people that I work with to um, allow them to express themselves, allow them the opportunity to grow and to lead and to, to make mistakes. I think that's one of the, one of the most important practices is um, be okay with yourself or others making mistakes. And, and I'm not talking about, you know, mistakes that could cost a firm, but, you know, mistakes that are part of learning. 
And um, I think as a, as a leader for a long time, you know, it was hard for me to do that because I couldn't allow myself to make a mistake. And if you can't, if I, if I couldn't allow myself to make a mistake, I certainly couldn't allow anybody else to. Um, and then you can take the, you know, in our case, you can take the same philosophy to your portfolio companies, um, you know, hold space, allow people to express their ideas, but also be, be a strong leader um, in terms of, of uh, listening to all the feedback and, 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 and taking other perspectives too. I think that's the mark of somebody who's mindful is that, you know, no, nobody has a monopoly on the right idea, the wrong idea, the amount of information that can influence any given decision. And when you're open to your momentary experience, I guarantee you're gonna be able to hear a lot more people. You're gonna be able to hear, you know, how people look at something. Matt, what I heard from you was you just have this sort of clarity of mind, right? So whether it's considering an investment opportunity, there's a wealth of information and a poverty of attention, someone said, but to be able to kind of zone in and see that opportunity and, and even to do that itself requires a tremendous amount of awareness and removing all the clutter. And yeah. then I really heard you talk about how how you really conduct yourself with others and whether it's your team, whether it's your uh, portfolio companies. But again, this idea of bringing compassion into those conversations and allowing them to be their best selves. Um, and I love what you said about you didn't allow yourself to fail. So how could you allow others to make mistakes, but have giving that permission and, and what is a mistake anyway? We know about the growth mindset, which says mistakes are only opportunities for learning and growth, right? Yeah. And how many startups have you seen that they, 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 they move in one direction, realize that's not going to work. So they pivot, they move in, a dire in, in another direction. Those aren't mistakes. Those are, those are just adapting based on what you're learning and um, bringing purpose and intention to whatever the endeavor is that you're pursuing. So it works the same in a big corporation. And as we all know, nothing is forever. So you always want to keep innovating and keep refreshing. You know, I, I see companies sometimes that, you know, have been around for so long. And part of their secret is they are always innovating. They're always bringing fresh ideas to the table. Um, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. So I think in terms of the work bucket, um, can you share any kind of personal story maybe where you really saw the value of mindfulness shine through? I would say in making um, difficult decisions, um, when I'm really mindful, I can also have a really good sense of whether somebody might be ready for a certain role or maybe they need some more growth and maybe they need a different opportunity or maybe they do need to kind of be be given the freedom to sink or swim it's just given me a lot more clarity around decision making and um learning to trust my you know my uh my instincts my my heart uh oprah calls it the internal gps but we, we all have these, as I've spoken about, these belief systems that tell us certain things. How many times have anybody uh, on, this, uh, on this webcast been in a situation where your mind was telling you one thing and your heart was telling you another thing and you went with your thoughts and it turned out to not be the right thing to do? Um, it's just given me a lot more alignment, right? I, I, I can parse through those thoughts that you know, are old or are a, are a function of my belief system that, you know, I'm not going to listen to and find those ones that are kind of aligned with what I think, uh, to the best of my ability, are the right thing to do in this situation. And it served me, it served me well, but it's particularly served me well when there's a difficult decision to make, whether it's with respect to an investment that's not going well, with respect to somebody who maybe is not the right person for a particular job. Maybe they could be repurposed or, or maybe it's just not the right place for them. Um, and having the clarity, uh, you know, it's very hard to let somebody go, but having the clarity around 
um, kind of knowing, you know, this, this, I'm doing this mindfully and, and I'm transparent with the individual about why, right? And, and I think people really appreciate that. They really appreciate honesty and transparency and the respect that comes with that. And people, you know, I think people who, who think about it, we, we've all had jobs that were not perfect for us. Um, and I really respect someone who tells me, you know what, I think, I just think this isn't the right job for you. Um, and I'm not telling them that from a, from a perspective of I know and they don't, but just this, this, this is how I'm seeing it. And I think you're, you're going to be more productive to our firm in a different role. Wow, that's definitely a difficult conversation to have and to be able to, to bring mindfulness to that sort of conversation as a leader um, and, 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 and sense that energy from the other person um, is pretty amazing, Matt. And you know, I think leadership is sort of one other point. Um, I think leadership is a lot about showing up for your organization and showing up can look a lot of different ways, but showing up for your organization and mindfulness in particular has, has really given me a path to show up for myself. Because if you can't show up for yourself, it's gonna be hard to show up for your organization in, in, in a way that's authentic. Absolutely. So I'm seeing a couple of questions in the Q&A that may be related. And I think one of them is really around judging. And it's more about at what point do you decide that you should start to judge someone? Because we talk about meeting people where they're at and not judging. And um, so at what point do you feel like if you give someone compassion space and creative freedom, but they continue to underperform, at what point do you say we can no longer not judge you because the, the work is not strong enough. And I think it's important to clarify like that judgment versus the judgment we may be talking about in mindfulness, so. Yeah, I, I think maybe assessment would be a good word when you're, you're thinking about, because I, 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 I know we all, <laughs> I don't think there's any great revelation here, but we all go through the day judging um, ourselves and those around us. I think what the, the question you're asking is when, when do you know when, you know, how, how do you think about the, the situation where an employee may just not be the right person for a particular role and how do you move to, um, you know, reaching some conclusions about that, you know, having the assessment, um, you're going to conclude that, you know, the change is made. You know, I don't, I don't think there's any right or wrong answer to that. It's, it's a very subjective thing. And I think you have to, you have to look at the performance over a period of time and you have to, you have to take the counsel of others, you know, on your teams and see what the collective feedback is um, and, and make a decision. There's never a perfect time to do it. My, my experience in doing it though, is to do it with, with clarity and to do it with respect and to do it with the transparency that is appropriate in any particular situation. And you, you, you make a call on it, you know, it's, it's, it's never going to be perfect and it doesn't need to be. But I, I think if it's, if it's well thought out and, and well researched, um, it, it's probably going to be a good decision. Thank you, Matt. So Matt, I think um, one question here um, is around difficult people and how do you deal with difficult people when there is no choice in having them in your life? I just thought that was interesting, uh, an interesting one to pick. Um, yeah, that's a, that, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm sure that we all have people in our lives who are not easy. Um, my experience has been that it's important to set boundaries for, um, people that occupy those places in your life, whatever those boundaries might, might be. Um, boundaries are very personal. And, and what I would say about boundaries is mindfulness is really important in setting good boundaries, but also trying our best to maintain them. And um, whether it's in the workplace, whether it's in your personal life, your relationships, setting boundaries around what 
is acceptable and not acceptable for you. I know for me, setting boundaries was always really hard because I didn't have that, you know, that sense of, of worth rooted. Um, and boundaries now are, boundaries are never easy, but they're, they're a lot easier than they used to be. So I, I would say set, setting boundaries and using mindfulness to help you uh, maintain those. And setting boundaries mindfully and compassionately, right? And it can be done. Absolutely can be done. <laughs> so Matt, um, you know, I just wanted to take one moment to just reflect on how we got here and, and thank a couple of people, if I might. Um, one is Jeff Walker, who you know well, and who was our first mindful on Wall Street Fireside chat special guest back in June. And he was kind enough to suggest we connect with you, which we took note of. And the second is my very own mentor from over 20 years who I met at Credit Suisse when I first joined, who still cares dearly about my decisions and is just so in touch with me that after I uh, forwarded him Jeff Walker's video from the Mindful on Wall Street Fireside chat without my even asking, he sent it on to you and asked you to, uh, to kind of get involved with us, which you so generously did. So I did want to thank that circle of compassion and kindness uh, that floats around us, people exhibiting it like Jeff and, and Bob. So wanted to share my gratitude because without them, we wouldn't have you here. And this has just been such an amazing fireside chat. Yeah, that's, that's great. You're both wonderful people. So thank you for acknowledging them. And then I just wanted to um, thank you for being so vulnerable, so authentic, and, and being so courageous to share your journey and where you started and giving us all that hope and that potential that we can all sort of, you know, we know what the outer world looks like, but we can all think about that inner journey and have the courage to really understand ourselves, develop that awareness. And then with that, we can then translate it to, to uh, you know, building others and, and their skills. And so thank you for being that exemplary leadership model, um, which, you know, and telling your story, to be honest, because it's not easy to do uh, in a culture that talks only about success, to be able to share failure and to share challenges is really noteworthy and gives us all a lot of inspiration. So thank you so much, Matt. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And I just like to end with, I know you do a lot of amazing work outside of your day job and your social impact space. I've, I've spoken to Beth who runs your work and love to hear how you fit that piece in and, and what impact you're making in that space with mindfulness. Well, I think that the, the three areas that we really try to focus on are health and wellness and really, you know, this, this idea that, you know, how, how do we set ourselves up to thrive? How, how do we kind of be present to these experiences? And mindfulness is a huge piece of that. Um, the energy transition and, you know, moving ourselves from, you know, fossil fuel based energy to something that, you know, is a lot more decarbonized. Um, again, hearing, you know, we, we, we live in a world where it doesn't really work to say, this is, this is what I want to do. And somebody wants to do the complete opposite. So mindfulness helps me to be, uh, to be aware and, and to hold space for other perspectives and try to find this idea of unity, which is, you know, sh shared power, the, the, the idea of coming up with a solution that can work for, you know, for both sides of an issue. And then the last is the environment. And um, we haven't talked a lot about this, but the the interdependency of you know what I'll call the natural world and our species is is so paramount to our thriving. And I challenge anybody to show me somebody who's been dealing with something difficult in their life and who, who goes and sits in front of the ocean for 30 minutes and they don't feel better. So that's another the, the mindfulness that's inherent in the natural world, I think is a is a great tonic for all of us. And so that, that is in and of itself a practice in mindfulness. So those are the three things that you know, we're, we're trying to, to really focus on. We have some very specific things we're doing in each of those three, 
Uh, but they're all things that have been really important part and continue to be important part of my life. And again, tremendous gratitude, Matt, for, for your time and for sharing the space with us. Thank you, Lalia. Well, have a great evening, everybody. I look forward to continuing to stay engaged.